Okay, hello and welcome. We are in this video. We are taking a look at an A2 chemistry paper. Um, as always, the idea of these videos is that I go through and talk about how you want to go about getting at the question. Right. The point of these videos isn't the answers; those are in the mark scheme. Um, it, it's about how to approach the questions and what you want to be thinking about. Um, that's the, the general purpose of these videos. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first question, this one is about uh, dot cross bonding. Um, more, more than anything, um, a lot of this question comes from just carefully noting what the question wants and making sure that you draw them. Um, so simple things like uh, where is it? Contains a dative covalent bond. All right. So obviously you need to know what that is. A dative covalent bond is one with two electrons from the same atom. Um, and so you just need to make sure that you draw that on, i.e. having two electrons coming from your nitrogen in the actual uh, picture that you're drawing. Um, aside from that, you're just generally trying to fill in all of the all of the blanks, as it were. Um, the one other thing that you do need to know, I think, is that nitrous, uh, nitrogen, nitrate even, uh, nitrate contains a nitrogen-oxygen double bond. Um, the other thing that is worth noting, um, this isn't too clearly shown, but we talk about this added electron responsible for the overall negative charge. I in theory, an electron that wasn't there to start with. Um, we have a minus one charge, so there should only be one of these. And it actually doesn't matter where it goes. Um, essentially, any electron can be this square, um, because it doesn't matter. Um, so any of your electrons can be a square. It's easiest to put it just in one of the random lone pairs on an oxygen. Um, to keep it out the way and make sure you don't confuse yourself otherwise. Um, but yeah. All right. Um, but yes, so e each oxygen should have six of its own electrons. The nitrogen should have five of, it, of its own, etc. Okay, I think we've talked about that now. Um, okay, write an equation showing the action of heat. So action of heat... Uh, that means we've got our thermal decomposition here, right? We have a, an ionic compound, we're acting with heat, we've got thermal decomposition. Um, that is an equation that you essentially need to know. Um, it's not too bad to work with. Um, you get nitrogen dioxide and magnesium oxide. Uh, describe and explain the trend that is observed in the thermal stabilities. So first you need to know what trend this is. And the idea is that they get more stable the further down you go the group. Um, the reasoning behind that is, well, OK, so why are we getting more stable? What are we actually breaking? We're breaking apart our nitrate ion into nitrogen dioxide. Um, and what's going on is that as your cation gets bigger, it essentially gets weaker in a way. Right? The bigger your cation is with the same charge, the weaker it is because the more dispersed that charge is. Um, when you have that more dispersed charge, it has less of an effect on other things, in this case your nitrate ion. Um, so the weaker your, the, the more dispersed the charge on your cation, the less pulled apart, the less polarized the bond on the nitrate ion gets, and therefore the more thermally stable it is. Uh, because polarizing the bond, pulling the electrons to one end, that's making it less of a bond and more of an ionization. Um, okay. When we have concentrated nitric acid and we add it to copper turnings, so copper, a brown gas is evolved. Use data from the data booklet to construct an ionic equation for this reaction. So ultimately, what you're looking for here is to consider, well, okay, we have an ionic equation, so what do we want? Nitric acid, you're reacting the, the ions that you have from, from nitric acid are H plus and NO3 minus, right? Copper ions, you have a series of copper ion equations 
in your um, words in your data booklet. It's right in front of me, but there we go. You have you have those equations, and so you just want to be working with that to get your uh, equation and put it together. Um, apparently, nitrogen dioxide is brown. I will admit I didn't know that. Um, I guess that's something that. So if, if there you go, you know that what too as well now, but. Uh, yeah, so that tells you that you're evolving nitrogen dioxide. Um, but primarily, all you're looking for is to take two of your ionocarp equations, one for copper. Copper turnings means it's copper metal. So that means you have to start with a neutral copper um, and combine it with your nitric acid half equations. Okay, state two assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases. So that's just a definition of the kinetic theory. Um, so these are essentially just learning, but conditions of temperature and pressure under which real gases behave least like an ideal gas. Uh, the easiest way to, and, and then the second one is, uh, is the why. The easiest way to remember this one is that actually, fundamentally, ideal gases, uh, gases are least like ideal gases the closer the molecules are together, right? The more spread apart they are, the less they interact, and, and uh, the ideal gas assumes that they don't interact at all. So the, the closer together they get, the more they interact, the less they are like an ideal gas. So high pressure, they get closer together, and low temperature, they get closer together. And so then they start to behave less ideally. And again, why? Well, because then they start to get close together and they interact more. Their interactions are more important. All right, we have gassium, gaseous aluminium chloride is dimeric at low temperatures, but the dimer dissociates on heating. So, first of all, what is a dimer? It's where you've got two essentially complete covalent molecules, which are a perfectly fine molecule on their own, but they form just essentially an even bigger molecule at certain conditions. Uh, is it endothermic or exothermic? So the key idea is that the dissociation happens when you heat it. When you heat, you're putting heat in. And an endothermic reaction is one that takes heat in. So that's what you're going for there. Choose one reaction. Uh, so this is just something that you need to know. Unfortunately, uh, th there are many there are well, I mean there are many but there are a selection that you know that you can choose um, you th th this this is purely just you need to know and draw what you know um, there's not a lot to explain there it's not much of a question it's more of a demand but there we go okay write equations with state symbols to define the following so Um. Okay, so um, this is this is worded slightly oddly. Um, the most useful. So when they say to define the following, um, I mean defining bond. What they mean is define the reaction which has an enthalpy change that is this. OK, um, so what they mean by that is a reaction which is forming this bond and, and only this bond. Um, so in this case, you're looking for uh, creating a bromine bond. Um, or, or indeed breaking it. So. Yeah, I think I think I've, I think I think I've explained that reason. Essentially, you're you're looking for very simplified uh, reactions. Um, so in this case, for instance, you're going from CH three Br just to CH three plus Br, and with state symbols. And in this case, the state symbols are all just gases. Um, and similar idea for here. 
these are not stable compounds, right? This is not a reaction which will happen on its own uh, and, and go to completion without any other things happening, right? These will immediately react with other things. They are very unstable. But this is a definition, not an actual thing. And that's the key idea here. They're all gases, but yeah. Okay. So here now we're dealing with our group seven elements. Describe and explain, explain the trend in bond energies. So the key idea here is that as you go down the group, your atoms are getting bigger. You're getting further away from the nucleus. Your attraction is getting weaker. And so the bonds are getting weaker because there's less uh, attraction to the electrons holding them together. Um, that's, that's the key idea here. And then fluorine doesn't follow this trend because, well, we've said that as they get smaller, the attraction to the electrons from the nucleus gets better, and so the bond gets stronger. But fluorine actually gets too small. And at that point, the two nuclei start repelling one another, and so do all of the electrons around the atom repel each other. Um, and so they start pushing itself apart again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the key idea there. It's all in the size of the atom. Um, all right. Data from the data booklet to calculate the enthalpy change of the following. So, uh, what you are looking for here is your standard idea of enthalpy of formation would be not unreasonable. Um, it's kind of worth pointing out. Will they let you do that? Do you have the enthalpy of formation? That seems kind of excessively easy otherwise. Okay, no, right. You probably don't have enthalpy of formation. Fair enough. So, in that case, you are do doing this with bond enthalpies instead. Um, enthalpy of formation would be a bit too easy here, because that's just the answer. Um, so, bond enthalpies is what you're looking at here. So you have an HH bond, you have an XX bond, and you have an HX. You have two HX bonds, um, and then you're just looking for the difference in the totals of each side. Um, obviously, they're different for the, the two. So that's that's ultimately just an exercise in looking things up. Use these results to describe and explain the trend in the thermal stabilities of the hydrides of group seven. Uh, so the key idea is that the hydrides get weaker uh, as you go down the group. The bond strength gets less. And... And, and more to the point, the, the enthalpy of this reaction gets uh, weaker. More to the point, the backwards reaction uh, becomes easier to do. That's the key idea. Um, as the enthalpy gets weaker, of the enthalpy of the bond, your bond gets weaker, and therefore it's easier to split them apart. The less energy it takes to split them apart, the weaker the thermal stability, because thermal, that's heat, that's just energy that you're putting in. Um, and again, it's for the same reason, because the, the atoms are getting bigger, the attraction is getting weaker. Okay, bromine reacts with hot sodium hydroxide to give a solution which on cooling produces white crystals. It has a certain composition by mass. So this is an empirical formula question. Um, that is a method that you need to be able to do. Um, I don't think there is a, a great benefit in me going through it here. Uh, you need to be able to do it, but there's no point me spending a while going through it now. Um, if you can't do it, go and learn. There's plenty of stuff on the internet and things, and if you can, you're already happy with this. Um, construct an equation for the reaction between Br2 and hot NaOH. So for this one, what you're looking to do is, well, you have your reactants, so you can put them on one side, you have your product uh, on the other, and you then just want to try and balance it out. Um, it is worth noting your product only contains sodium, oxygen, and Br. I'm putting circles because you can't draw dots on the program I'm using. Um, sodium, oxygen, and bromine. You've got hydrogen over here, so you're going to need to give uh, water, right? You have a solution, you're in water, so you're going to need to produce water as well. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So you're going to have these these on one side, your your formula on the other, and water as a byproduct. I think. Okay. So the electrical conductivities of some group four elements are given below. Uh, from consideration of structures, suggest reasons for the following. So it's worth noting that this one and this one are actually reasonably conductive. These two are essentially insulators. Um, electrical conductivity of silicon is less than that of graphite. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is, so for this one, uh, these are both covalent structures, but graphite, as we know, has free electrons. That's why it conducts electricity. Silicon clearly doesn't. Silicon has a diamond-like structure. No free electrons going around, no conducting. Tin compared to germanium, that's because tin is actually forming a metallic structure, right? So that's got lots of free electrons now. Tin forms metallic bonding. Germanium, it's still covalent, and so there aren't free electrons going around. It's weaker covalent, so that, you know, you can pull one or two off, but it's nothing on the order of the uh, metallic bonding. Using data from the data booklet where appropriate, write equations for the following reactions of compounds from group four elements. So, uh, using data from the data booklet, what do they want you to do with data here? Um, Okay, I'm not entirely sure, honestly, what they uh, what they want you to get from the data booklet, except for perhaps um, that you have some reactions or half equations in the data booklet that involve these. Perhaps um, the the equations themselves the answers are obviously in the mark scheme um i think by and large the idea is that you you need to know the types of reactions that your group four elements are undergoing um what is likely is that your data booklet will contain reactions like these for one or two of the group four elements but not all of them um, so one of the key points to recognize here is the idea that the same kind of reactions are going to happen for all of the elements in the same group because they are chemically very similar. Um, so recognizing that if you've got stuff that works for silicon, for instance, or lead, that that's going to work for germanium as well, or tin. Um, so yeah, I suspect that you have equations for lead. Uh, and you're applying them to tin and germanium. But that's just a guess. So yeah, all right, let's move on from that. Um, bromine reacts with a variety of organic compounds, and I mean, so it can halogenate them or it can replace them. Um, complete and balance the equation, including the structural formula of the organic product. So. What we are dealing with here is a rather, unless I'm much mistaken, yeah, it's a, a rather uh, different one. Um, so this is, you don't need to explain it in this particular case, but this is the one where you stick lots and lots of bromines on. So you, you stick three bromines onto your uh, benzene ring. Um, the type of equation of reaction is electrophilic addition, right? Um, basically, almost anything involving a benzene ring is electrophilic because a benzene ring is just completely chock full of electrons. Um, so, yes. 
the these are the organic chemistry questions are by and large learning based um there isn't you there are obviously there are reasons behind them but you do ultimately have to know what's going to happen um so as i say in this case you're you're adding three bromines to your ring um in the following one uh, the fact that it is a ring is not particularly uh, relevant unless i am much mistaken yeah so under this one you're adding bromine to a double bond um, you're adding bromine across a double bond so you get a bromine stuck on each one um, and for the last one you just have a regular alkane that doesn't in general oh okay right so in general that doesn't react however you can do free radical substitution um, so you you split your bromine into free radicals and then you can add it to your uh, alkane so yes all right um yeah it feels difficult but i mean obviously there's a lot to learn there but there's not a lot of depth to it in terms of explaining what's going on um you don't need to explain what's going on for this you just need to write the answers down um so i think i'll i'll just leave that one there unfortunately um so yeah okay so here we have a fairly complex hydrocarbon, and we are going to heat it with manganese ions. We are going to form three organic compounds. So the question we want to be asking ourselves is, what are we doing when we heat with manganate ions? Um, what are our manganate ions reacting with, and what are we going to produce? So. Our magnet arms are ultimately reacting with our double bonds. Okay, that's that's what they're doing here, uh, and and they're going to split our double bonds. They're they're going to split our our hydrocarbon at the double bonds, and we're going to add oxygen double bonds in their place mostly. Um, suggest the identities so. Um, hmm. Ah yes, okay, yeah. Uh, I th I think you you could you could make an argument for certain other ones, but you're going to break your chains apart. Um, Okay, I'm I'm talking myself in circles here. Uh, you break you break your chains apart at the double bonds. Um, so you're going to break this double bond and you're going to break this double bond, right? So that's going to leave you with one hexagon, one chain of four carbons, and one chain of two carbons, right? And then you're going to add. Uh, you're, you're going to add your oxygen double bonds. In each of those places. So these two carbons, they are in the middle of a chain afterwards, right? After after the reaction, they're still in the middle of the chain, so they're going to form a ketone. Whereas these two carbons, they're at the end of a chain once you've split the bond. And if they're at the end of the chain, they're going to form an aldehyde. So you're going to have a hexagon with a ketone on, you're going to have a two carbons with an aldehyde on, and then you're going to have this one where you've got an aldehyde on one end and a ketone that's off the other side. Um, so that the key idea here is knowing that you're breaking the double bonds, and then what's turning into a ketone or an aldehyde. Okay, there we go. That one went. That one was was a bit more explainable. Um, 
use the relevant letter to identify which of your compounds will react with each of the following reagents. So what you're looking for here, ultimately, we've said we're forming some ketones, some aldehydes, and some that are both. So then you're just talking about, well, okay, what do these compounds re do with aldehydes and ketones? And that's just all you're looking at then. Um, okay. Naturally occurring amino acids can be classified as amphipro amphiprotic. Amphiprotic. Cool. That's an interesting word. It's one that can act as both a bronsted Lowry acid and base. So the first point to make is what is your bronsted Lowry definition? And that's the idea of dealing with acids and bases in terms of protons. So proton acceptors, proton donators. Other way around in this case, but there we go. Um, so yeah. Oh, right, there we go. So here's your definition. That's just your definition. All alpha amino acids are soluble in water since they can form hydrogen bonds. Draw diagrams to show how the carboxylic acid and amino groups of alanine can form hydrogen bonds with water molecules. So this is just your, your key idea of what is forming your hydrogen bonds. Um, so you've got You've got polarity, you've got a delta negative oxygen, you've got a delta positive hydrogen here and a delta negative oxygen here, and then here you have a delta negative nitrogen, delta positive hydrogens here. And you're just drawing the bonds as regular from hydrogen to oxygen, uh, or sometimes from hydrogen to nitrogen. Um, although this nitrogen isn't realistically very reachable, but you can reach it because it's a planar, well, it's a triangular molecule. Um, okay, draw the structure of the Zwitterionic form of glycine. So up here we have glycine. That tells us what our R group is. Here is our R group. Zwitterionic is just talking about which way our double bond is going, I believe. Uh, Oh, no, it's not. No, I'm talking rubbish. I'm... There we go. That Sorry, that is one that I had uh, completely forgotten. The... Right, so, Zwitterionic means it's... Okay. Zwitterionic is talking about the fact that uh, oftentimes with an amino acid, this hydrogen actually goes over to your nitrogen group. And so the, atom, the, the molecule actually ionizes itself. Um, and so that's what you're looking for here. You get a CO minus and an AH3 plus. Um, and you're just drawing that having moved the hydrogen over. So yeah. Okay. The amino acid alanine can be formed by the reaction of a certain compound with an excess of ammonia. Outline a mechanism for this reaction using curly arrows. So here we have a chlorine. So what we're going to have is nucleophilic substitution, right? Ammonia, excess ammonia, nucleophilic. Our chlorine is pulling electrons to itself, leaving a positive, a delta positive carbon, and you're just using that uh, mechanism as usual. Um, I think there's not much more to say about that. So amino acids can form different ions at different pH values. Suggest the structures of the ions formed from alpha amino acids. So lysine and, did they say, what did they say? Lysine and aspartic acid. So aspartic acid actually has a second carboxylic acid group on it. Uh, lysine has an NH, has a, a nitrogen group. At low pH, lysine with its nitrogen, well, at low pH, you've got lots of H plus ions, so it's going to grab an extra H plus and it's going to form NH3 pluses on all of its NH groups, of which it has two. At pH 14, aspartic acid 
it's going to lose the hydrogens from both of its acid groups. But its nitrogen groups aren't, so, uh, but vice versa, at pH 1, your acid groups are still going to have their hydrogens attached. At pH 14, your nitrogen groups are not going to be gaining any extra hydrogens. So that's the key point in these two pictures. How many different dipeptides is it possible to synthesize, each containing two of the three amino acids, alanine, serine, and lysine? Uh, unless I'm, hang on, I'm going to check the mark scheme because this seems like a, yeah, okay, so th th this is just a combinations question. It's got very little to do with chemistry, really. Um, it's three times two times one, which is six. So, yeah. Um, write the structural formula of one of these dipeptides incorporating serine and alanine. Um, so there, you're just linking the two as with your general peptide bond, uh, bonding the carboxylic acid of one to the nitric group of the other, uh, nitric, nitri yeah, nitrogen group of the other, and making sure that your R groups are for the two that they've demanded. Okay, most naturally occurring amino acids have a chiral center and experience exhibit stereoisomerism, deferring the term. That's just your definition, handedness, etc. There are four optical isomine, isomers of threonine. I'm, I'm not going to make the joke about fouronine, but I kind of did. Um, which of the structures, G, H, or J, is identical to structure F? Okay, so here, what you are looking for is you're looking at your chiral centers, okay? So essentially, you're taking each of these molecules and you're drawing an imaginary line down the middle. And you're saying, we don't care about the orientation of one side relative to the other. So we're allowed to spin these sides round. And so what you're looking for is essentially, if I spin these sides round, independently of one another, can I turn F into one of these other uh, molecules? And for one of them, the answer will be yes. Um, uh, so yeah. The idea is ultimately to look at have I um, have I not exchanged two groups under as a mirror image in one of these molecules? Um, they're all drawn with different uh, with different legs in different places, which is slightly annoying um, and makes it slightly harder. But yeah, the key idea is to look at are the carbon centers the same or different. Um, each half of the molecule is independent. It's not like a double bond where orientation matters. That's the key idea here. The other two of the structures represent two of the other three possible isomers. Complete the following partial structure of the fourth. So what you are then looking to do is swap Basically, swap any pair of um, any one pair of groups. Swap any pair such that it's different to the other three. Um, so you're looking for the one combination that hasn't been formed yet. Um, you always form a stereoisomer that is different by swapping one pair of groups, right? So, for instance, if without changing what the legs look like. I swap OH and H, for instance, right? Were I to do that, I would have a different stereoisomer to F. That's just an example. Probably some of these. Yeah, so actually, if you, if you take a look at all of these, these all have the same right-hand side, okay? That they have the same set of legs um, on the right-hand side, uh, except for this one, except for J. 
uh, J has got it rotated, um, but I think it's the same still. Um, I'm not quite sure. We'll take a minute to think about it, but yeah. Um, if you can swap H and OH, then it'll look different. So that's one example. Okay, I've talked enough about that. Let's move on. Um, enzymes are particular types of proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. They can be reduced by inhibitors. State one example of a substance that can act as a non-competitive inhibitor in enzyme reactions. Um, I think the usual one that they like is cyanide, but uh, or is cyanide competitive? Maybe cyanide's competitive. I'm not sure. Um, they've got heavy metals as as their big examples, so I would go with that. Heavy metals. Um, yeah, cyanide must be competitive. Actually, it's a fairly organic looking molecule. Um, in general, uh, inorganic molecules will be uh, non-competitive and organic type molecules will be competitive inhibitors as a kind of general rule, but that's not really important. Um, explain why it is a non-competitive inhibitor. So more than anything, that's actually the, they're look, what they're really looking for is the definition of a non-competitive inhibitor, right? You're, they're not looking for some deep explanation specific to the, the compound that you chose, the, the metal or whatever. That is actually looking for the definition. Um, that's all it's looking for there. Uh, recognizing that is, is the most useful part there. Okay, here we have the rate of a reaction. Sketch a graph showing the rate of this reaction if a competitive inhibitor was present. So these are just your, your different ideas. So rate of reaction versus uh, concentration regularly and with a competitive inhibitor, essentially what you are doing is reducing, almost reducing the concentration. Um, You're, you're slowing down the rate. But the key idea is that your competitive inhibitor is competing with your substrate. And so eventually, your substrate will win out if you make the concentration high enough. And so the key idea is that as you get to this end, eventually they have to be in the same place. And when you start at zero, well, they obviously both have to start at zero. But in the middle, it's going to be lower. So it's lower at all points, but it's going towards the same place. That's the key idea here. OK. DNA is responsible for encoding amino acid sequence to produce proteins. We have lots of things involved in protein synthesis. I thought this was a chemistry paper. This this appears to be lots and lots of biology. Um, not sure I signed up for this, but there we go. So uh, write them in the connect in in the correct uh, sequence. So I think it's T I'm ribosome. Is it not M ribosome T? Well, there we go completely wrong. Um, yes, I will apologize. Uh, it's been considerably longer since I did any biology than it has any uh, chemistry. Um, okay, I mean, okay. I, I am going to make the argument that, by and large, this is, like most of biology, this is this just requires you to learn it. Um, there's not a lot of explanation that I can give here, not, not a lot of deep insights. Um, the answers are in the mark scheme, and I don't know enough about biology to give you any deeper insights that might be there. 
if I could. So we're going to move on past this. I apologize for that, but as I say, I think by and large that just requires you to learn the uh, learn the things. Okay, instrumental analysis is really important. We have NMR and X-ray crystallography. Both techniques use part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Which techniques uses radiation with the longer wavelength? And in which part of the spectrum is it found? So, longer wavelength is your NMR. X-rays are very short wavelength. Um, there is a clue, so this is a little bit of exam technique. Um, they ask, in which part of the spectrum is it found? So the answer obviously isn't X-ray crystallography, because the, otherwise they would just be giving you the answer. Um, the answer is NMR, and I mean, it's just a definition. It's just learning it, but it's radio. Um, NMR spectroscopy provides detailed information about protons, but X-ray crystallography is unable to detect them. Explain these facts. Okay, so um, what do they want? Okay, so the, there are there are two key points that they're after here, as as is obvious. Um, the first is that NMR spectroscopy is about spin. It's about nu. That, that, that's what the N is, right? It's about nuclear spin. Um, protons have a nice simple spin, and therefore it's it detects them and provides detailed information rather well. Um, X-ray crystallography, on the other hand, that's all about electrons. That's about electron clouds. That's what that works on. Protons in a structure lose their electron clouds, right? That, as you know, hydrogen is quite electropositive and almost any atom will pull its electrons away from it. On top of that, hydrogen only has one electron and it forms one bond. So in any bond with any atom over here, um, not necessarily, I mean, it's X, but it's not necessarily a halogen, we have our hydrogen and we have our bond, right? And so our proton is over here, our bond is over here. So our proton is still the other side, it's still sticking out. You have, you have the electrons over here, if you like, and your proton is off on a leg on its own. So they essentially stick out from your electron cloud, and therefore they get almost completely ignored by your X-ray crystallography. So that's the idea here. They have spin, so NMR spectroscopy works, but the X-ray crystallography just kind of doesn't really see them because they don't have any electrons around them. Okay, protein found in hair contains cysteine. Crystalline cysteine was examined using X-ray crystallography. State which atom produced the strongest reflection. So which one produced the strongest reflection? Well. Yeah, okay. I mean, the explain your answer here is easier. Um, sulfur, and the answer they're looking for is because it has the highest electron density, right? As we said, X-ray crystallography is all about electrons, electron density. So it's the one with the highest electron density. And in this case, that's sulfur, uh, primarily because it's the biggest atom. Um, it's got more electrons just sitting in the atom than everything else because it's got three shell, it's in its third shell instead of its second or first. Um, compound P is an alcohol that can be converted into compound Q. Uh, okay, spectral analysis were carried out. The max spectrum of P shows an M, M plus one peak ratio of 4.5 to 0 0.15. Okay, I've never seen things written in quite this terminology before. Um,
Okay. Um, I, I, I don't honestly know what it means by m, m plus 1, but from the Mark scheme, ultimately, there, there is an equation that you have for turning the m, m plus 1 peak ratio into a, uh, into a number, into a number of atoms. Um, so I guess you're just supposed to use that. Uh, I'm afraid I actually don't really know what it's talking about here. Sorry, that's that's kind of bad, but I think it's just a fairly straightforward maths question. Uh, if it isn't, it's not worth very many marks, so I, I think it's probably a fairly straightforward question for you if you actually know what equation you're meant to be using. Um, so yeah. Okay, we have some NMR spectra. These are rather nicer. In the spectrum of P, clearly label the peak due to the OH group with an X. So P it has one uh, one broad group that's so. Um, the answer turns out to be that it has three uh, three carbons. Um, Label the peak due to the OH group with an X. So all you're looking for here is what is the delta for your OH group, right? Um, ra rather than the answers, as I've said before, are on the mark scheme. So really, this this is a data book based question, right? When you're looking at what is what, it's your delta. That's what's important. Um, your delta gives you a range saying, oh, this is where this goes, this is where this goes, etc. Right? So that's all you're looking for for that one. Uh, state how many different proton environments are present in compound Q. So different proton environments, that's just the number of peaks. That's all that. that what all that really means is the number of separate peaks. Okay? Um, Note that that's separate peaks, as in this and and this are one peak each. They're just split a bit, right? But they are individual proton environments. What evidence is there in these spectra that P, P is a primary rather than a secondary alcohol? So, what is primary, secondary, tertiary? That is how many hydrogens are attached to your uh, to the carbon that has the alcohol on it, right? Primary has three, secondary has two. Um, oh, sorry. Primary has two, secondary has uh, one, other, one hydrogen attached. Um, if you have a primary alcohol, then you have two hydrogens, which is going to give you a three split peak which means I'm guessing that this is your uh, OH peak. And then last of all, draw a structure for Q. Um, okay, so Q, I think ultimately what you're looking for is to say, oh, I've got, I've got X certain set of hydrogen environments um, I know how many hydrogen environments I have. These are these drawing questions are some of the mo most interesting ones involved um, because they're just a bit of problem solving, really. It's just how can I put my my atom together? You have three hot carbons, so my advice would always be draw your carbons first and then start putting stuff on them um, in a way that you can try and make sense of. So yeah. Okay, um, until 1985, carbon was thought to exist only in two forms, carb, uh, graphite and diamond. In 1985, we found Buckminster fullerenes. The other two forms of carbon, oh, so we've just said that, give three differences in physical properties between these two forms. So despite the fact that they've started with buckyballs, uh, we're actually talking about graphite and diamond here. 
differences in physical properties, they're your classic set of electrical conductivity, hardness, and melting point. Um, now we have a buckyball. It's just a better name in general. Uh, suggest a reason why, but why it reacts with hydrogen under suitable conditions and give a formula for the product. So, a formula for the product, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so, uh, ultimately, if you look at your bucky, buckyball, you will see that each carbon has one, two, three bonds coming out of it, okay? And that's true of every single one here. Carbons want to make four bonds. So this is actually much like a um, benzene ring, right? Essentially, it is a, a giant structure like a benzene ring. It's unsaturated, right? There are essentially lots and lots of double bonds in it. And therefore, each carbon can make an extra bond. So if you give it lots of hydrogen, they will. Each carbon will make one bond outward to a hydrogen, and it'll just sort of turn prickly with lots of hydrogen sticking out. If every single one of your 60 carbon atoms makes a bond with one hydrogen atom, you end up with 60 hydrogen atoms. So you get C60H60. So that's the idea. Um, the key thing to recognize, the key thing to see, is that each carbon is making three bonds. Um, OK, we now have graphene, ever the, uh, ever the poster child of modern science. Graphene is in the form of sheets of carbon one atom thick. Calculate the number of carbon atoms present in a sheet of graphene with a mass of one thousandth of a gram. Um, so, ultimately, this has nothing to do with graphene, right? Uh, realistically, this is just an NMR question, right? Number of uh, mass is equal to the number of moles times the MR or the AR in this case. We know the relative atomic mass of carbon. We know the mass, so we can get a number of moles. And then, well, the number of carbon atoms is just the number of moles times the number of atoms in a mole, which is Avogadro's constant, 6.022 times 10 to the 23. The number of hexagons in a large sheet of graphene can assume to be one half of the number of carbon atoms. Each hexagon has a certain area, so calculate the area of the sheet. So we have a number of carbon atoms, we'll call it NC. If we divide that by 2, this is our number of hexagons. We multiply that by the area of a hexagon, we have our area of our sheet. That's nice and simple. Would you expect samples of graphene and Buckminster fullerene to be electrical conductors? Explain your answers. So, graphene is first of all nice and simple, right? Much like graphite, it is a big long sheet, big long continuous sheet with lots of free electrons. And so yes, we expect it to be an electrical conductor, right? We've got lots of free electrons that can go from one end, up, end to the other uninterrupted. Buckyballs are more, slightly more complicated, right? They still have free electrons, but we've got individual balls, right? So we've got ball, 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 ball. An electron can go from one place to the other on an individual ball, but there's all this empty space in between. And so there's no way for them to get from one ball to the other and therefore from one side of your sample to the other side of your sample. So no, they don't conduct electricity. They can conduct it across one ball, but one ball is very, very tiny, and so that doesn't really mean anything. So graphene, yes, because it's long, it's a long sheet. But Buckminster Fullerene, no, because the balls are still individual and separate. Even though they can, they do have free electrons. Both of them have free electrons. Okay, so 
that brings us to the end of this paper. Um, hopefully this was reasonably helpful to you. And yeah, I, uh, I will leave you there. Goodbye.